The final verse of 1 Corinthians 15 is really the climax of the entire chapter. It reads just like Matt had it, but let me give it to you again. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Now, when we start talking about work of the Lord in a church on a Sunday morning, that can go wrong in at least five different ways. It's a sensitive area for at least five different reasons. First one is it can just simply produce a sense of guilt. You say, I'm not doing enough work of the Lord. I feel guilty. Kind of wish I didn't come to church today. Uh, second reason it can be sensitive is because talking about the work of the Lord can seem arrogant. So the preacher guy stands on the black box and he says, do the work of the Lord. And it's like, is he just saying, be like him? Is he just a bit up himself? And so it can be a sensitive topic to talk about the work of the Lord. It can appear as well, third reason, to be self-serving. So the guy from the church stands on the black box and says, hey, let's give ourselves to the work of the Lord. And you go, ah, oh, I get it. Church needs more volunteers. Uh, they're just self-serving. They're just promoting their little organization. Uh, they don't really care about me. And so when you hear me talk about the work of the Lord or Paul talk about giving yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, you can totally mishear it. Uh, fourth reason uh, that it can be sensitive is it can be very poorly timed. It can be an ill-timed message. Um, some of you guys had horrible weeks. People have let you down. Your body has let you down. Life is not going how you wanted it to go. And you only just made it to church today. Or maybe you didn't even make it to church and you're watching on the live stream or you're listening to the recording later. And you tuned in today because you wanted something uplifting. You wanted something encouraging. You didn't want to be told to give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. And so it can be seen... It can be an ill-timed message to talk about the work of the Lord. And finally... It can seem to, even though it doesn't, downplay the value of whatever you did Monday to Friday this week. Where we talk about the work of the Lord, you may hear Paul saying that whatever you did Monday to Friday isn't valuable, only this kind of maybe working for a church or something is valuable. That's not what it's saying. And so we need to clear that up straight away. And so I'm aware that as we come to the work of the Lord as a topic for today, that it's a very sensitive topic. But what this passage is meant to do is to give us a confident expectation of glorious eternal things and to help us reverse engineer our life in light of that, to reframe the trajectory of your existence in the only way that actually makes sense. And so Paul climaxes his letter by saying, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. That's going to be our 35 minutes today. Now, uh, we are ending a series, uh, and so let me take you through where we've been. Today is the last week in our re-series, our 1 Corinthians series. We started with a little mini-series in the pink, which was chapters 8 through 10, and that was a re-freedom. The Corinthians have recently come to faith, and they're asking, how does that affect how we used to eat meat sacrificed to idols? Do we still have that freedom? Uh, The green series with the little image of the head was about re-gathering, so chapter 11 particularly, uh, where Paul was talking about the way that they got together and how to maximize that to actually be for God's glory. Uh, Then in the yellow, we talked about uh, re-gifts. So the mannequin is about the, the idea of the body there, that actually the gifts that we have are for the building up of the body and not for some kind of personal gratification. And today we're finishing the blue series with the image of the trumpet, re-future. Uh, Paul is latching on to a dispute in Corinth about the nature of their eternity. Particularly, he's latching on to the idea of will there be a physical bodily existence once we are raised with Jesus Christ? And so to... um. 
take you through the details of where we've been in the blue series, so the chapter 15. Uh, Matt, in the first week, helpfully preached for us that the resurrection is central to the gospel. You really don't have the Christian message if you subtract Jesus coming alive again from the dead. You've missed the point entirely. Uh, Tim, last week from verses 12 to 34, showed that Jesus' resurrection ensures ours. The images of first fruit. So just like he was raised, we too will be raised. And today, verses 35 to 58, we really get into the details of this resurrection thing. What will that actually look like? How does it work? And why do we need it in the first place? So to break it down, pretty much the way that Paul seems to be thinking is in three categories. So how, why, and so. The details of this physical resurrection. The necessity of of this resurrection and the application. We're going to spend a disproportionate amount of time in the application. And so with all of that, let me pray. And we're actually going to start in verse 12. God, you're so good. Thank you for the eternal hope that we have. Please protect us in this room today against misunderstanding but please help us to understand the gravity and the life-shaping implications and help us to actually accept. And God, please please use our time together right now. We commit it to you. And if you agreed, you said, Amen. Amen. So uh, last week in verse 12, uh, Paul really frames the issue. Chapter 15, verse 12. He says, If it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say... There is no resurrection of the dead. Now, in this particular case, they're not so much doubting that Jesus rose from the dead. They're doubting that after we die, we too will have a physical, bodily resurrection. Uh, And so they're kind of swimming in this Plato um, kind of world of of philosophy. They're thinking about body and soul. And Plato really espoused the soul and wasn't so keen on the body. So it makes sense that they're asking exactly the question that they ask in verse 35, where they say, but someone will ask, Well, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? Uh, Plato, to be honest, wanted the soul to be free from the constraints of the body. And so as soon as you say there's going to be a physical post-death resurrection, uh, the Corinthians, influenced by that line of thinking, are probably thinking, that doesn't sound that good. I'm waiting for my soul to be freed from the body. Now you're saying it's going to stay within a body? And to be honest, some of us also think a bit like Plato as well, because some of us have, at one point in our lives, conceptualized heaven as a floaty, spiritual, ghosty kind of place, rather than a physical place. But Paul is saying, no, it's, it's a physical place. And think about it this way. Biblically, God created the body, and he created the body before the fall and declared it to be good. So God made good bodies. Therefore, as Christians, we ought to be pro-body people. So unlike Plato, who thought that our bodies are tombs for the soul, Paul says, no, 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 they're temples for the Holy Spirit. We are pro-body people. And then they kind of, he takes up an imaginary discussion partner or he anticipates an objection, and the objection comes in verse 35. Well, someone will ask, How are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? They're really asking for the details. And so that's point one today, the details of the resurrection. And his first way of explaining it is he says it's kind of like a plant. It's kind of like a tree. Verse 36, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined and each kind of seed He gives its own body. He's saying it's kind of like a plant, kind of like a tree. Now, don't push the analogy too far, but the idea is that um, what you sow, so when you put a seed into the ground, you put it in the ground, that's kind of like the seed dying. I know that isn't biologically how it works, but uh, that's the analogy because it's kind of like us. You put us in the ground once we die, and the analogy he's drawing there. Uh, When you sow, you don't plant the body that will be, but just a seed. So he's saying um, the tree or the plant that you get at the end is the full expression of the seed that you put in the ground, and so it will be with our bodies. Uh, So notice um, 
continuity and discontinuity, right? Um, you could use the words same and different. There's a, it's a bit the same, it's a bit different, there's a bit of continuity, there's a bit of discontinuity between our current bodies and the bodies that we can expect and look forward to in the new creation. Uh, particularly, you would say, well, the new body is the full expression of the current body. Kind of like a plant, kind of like a tree. So he keeps going, and he says, not all flesh is the same. People have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies, and there are earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another. The stars differ from star in splendor. Key word there for you to notice is like another. He, he's really keying in on the discontinuity angle in this bit where he says, hey, um, all the bodies have difference between them. That's kind of all you needed to get from that bit. But now he pushes on the continuity angle. So he's pushed on how they're different. He pushes on actually the fact that it's the same body that's raised. It's the same body that's raised. So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. Verse 42, the body that is sown is perishable. It's raised imperishable. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. So just to close off this continuity, discontinuity thing, um, you can say our body will be exactly the same as it is in our post-resurrection existence, that would be wrong. You're saying there's total continuity, but there's discontinuity, isn't there? Look at it. Uh, it's currently perishable. It will be imperishable. But you can't say they're totally different. You can't just say that we've chucked out the old body and put in a new body because it uses the word raised. So it is the same body in some sense, and it is a different body in some sense. There's discontinuity, and there's continuity. It's a bit the same, bit different. Let me key in on one particular word in this verse, which is the word perishable. Perishable. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, or if my experience is different to yours, but a large part of my existence is one long daily battle against my perishable body. It just doesn't always do what I'm expecting it will do, what I'm hoping it will do. Depending on who you listen to, uh, the human body hits its physical peak somewhere between the ages of 20 and 30. Now, for some of us in the room, that's good news. Some of us, it's not. 9am hated that joke. <laughs> and, um, but even if you're 20, if you're 20 in the room right now, you know that even though maybe your best years physically might still be ahead of you, your body is still so perishable and so weak and so often you just fall sick and you realize your own fragility. And it doesn't matter how much kale or keto or F45 you do, it still happens. But the hope is, the confident expectation is that we will have an imperishable, raised body. And you can look forward to that. The stuff that is wrong with your body right now will not be wrong with it in the future. It is sown in dishonor. It will be raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. So I look forward to that. Question for you. Do you reckon our bodies were perishable before the fall? So God creates the world, Adam and Eve in the garden. Then the fall happens. They eat the apple. That's the first sin in which we also participate just every time that we also choose to reject what we know of God. And then they get kicked out and death and disease starts being introduced into the world. And It seems like one of the ways to look at the big overarching arc of the Bible is to say we started in a garden. Then Jesus ends up kind of going into the garden of Gethsemane. Out of that ends up on the cross. And all of that ends up leading us back to the garden that's pictured at the end of Revelation 21. We're trying to get back to the pre-fall existence. And Jesus and what he did on that tree made that possible. And so it makes sense that we have to have a resurrected body. This is the trajectory of where we're going an imperishable body. And it makes sense that given all of that kind of background, he starts talking about Adam. 
in the next little bit, 44 to 49. If there was a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it's written, the first man, that's Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, that's Jesus, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural and after that. The spiritual, the first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven, as was the earthly man. So are those who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. Notice a couple of things. Verse 46, notice the order. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual. Now notice in verse 47, it says the first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. And we get a little bit of a hint of what our resurrection bodies might be like by looking at Jesus' resurrection body. And, you know, it was physical and he ate, but at the same time, uh, he seemed to be able to do some things which we can't currently do with our bodies. It gives us a hint about what our resurrected bodies will look like. And you get to verse 49, just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, Adam, so we shall bear the image of the heavenly man, Jesus. And so um, it really is necessary for us to have a, a physical resurrected body free from all of the corruption, the stain, the fallenness that we have experienced in this world. Uh, a large part of uh, heaven, the new heavens, the new earth, is that there will be no sin. There will be no rebellion against God. And so our bodies, which bear those marks, don't belong in that new heavens and new earth either. And so first point, we've been talking about how this happens, all the details, and then we move on to the necessity of a physical resurrection. And he picks up that idea starting in verse 50. I've added the underlines. Verse 50 says, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, starting the second point, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Uh, flesh and blood is another way in Bible language of talking about the stained, corrupted existence that you and I currently live in, where sin ruins everything and has its hand in everything, even while God begins to redeem what's going on right here. So th there is a fundamental incompatibility between our current existences and the new heavens and new earth to which we are eventually going to go. So we'll get new bodies to accompany that. Verse 51, listen, I tell you a mystery when Paul says that. It's kind of like, you know, pay attention at this point. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. When he says sleep, it's not quite a euphemism. It's more like a metaphor. Uh, it means that when a Christian dies, we don't need to grieve in the same way that we do for someone else because we know that really all they're going to experience is something kind of like a good night's sleep where they fall asleep, and on the other side, they wake up to Jesus' voice saying, you know, welcome into my kingdom, welcome into paradise. And so uh, when a Christian dies, we very correctly and helpfully say uh, the Christian has fallen asleep. Uh, but Paul says we will not all sleep. And what he means is not everyone who's a Christian will have died before they get their resurrection bodies. Because when Jesus comes back, the end of the entire history and the end, when, the end of biblical history, uh, he comes back and some Christians will still be living, but others will have died already. And that's what 51 is talking about. Some of us will never experience that sleep at all. Jesus could come back tomorrow. That would be us right there. Or we could die and Jesus could come back in 100 years or something. And in that case, we would say, oh, we're, we're all going to be change. So this resurrection will happen to everyone. We will all be changed. Now you get to 51. It's a sudden thing. 52. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. That's an announcing, a declarative kind of thing. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. I'm trying to show you that the resurrection, the physical resurrection, is a necessity and not just a nice bonus extra. Because if the physical resurrection doesn't happen, that means death kind of has a victory. 
Death claims our bodies, which God created, and he has to forfeit them. But no, God claims that body that he created back. And that's actually the fulfillment of scripture. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is, Paul's getting really excited. Paul's language starts to flourish a bit. There's lots of exclamation marks in there. Uh, Paul is celebrating the fact that we are able to participate in what Jesus Christ has won, which is victory over death. It makes Christians a very special people who do not have to fear death. Even though we experience it and we see other people go through it and it is a horrible reality still, it has lost its sting in its totality. I got someone to um, help me write this sermon and uh, there was one particular bit that they wrote that was way better than I could say it, so let me read it to you. It says, we're born into a world where decay and death are hallmarks. They aren't the inevitable experience of life, but even though it may seem here that they have the final victory, we can halt the march for a time, but we all succumb. This answers the cry of our hearts, which is, that shouldn't be the case. Death never feels right. It's not as things should be. But we see here that death has temporary reign, but God has victory. We've all felt the sting of death, taking a loved one too soon or too quickly or just at all. But God felt that sting so that he could remove that sting from us. We're talking about the cross right here where Jesus died on mercy's tree. God felt that sting so that he could remove that sting from us. And death is tragic, <coughs> but no longer something to be feared because the finality of death is the sting. And if you trust in Christ, it is gone, like a bee or a wasp without its sting, a smiley face. Um, if you're not a Christian, you're still considering the things of faith, or you've walked away and you're coming back. Uh, victory over death is what's on offer to you, along with many other things. The ability to not have to fear death the way that everyone else does. That is a stunning offer. Would you accept Jesus and make that your reality as well? Because as much as we believe in heaven, we do also believe in hell. And we also like you. And so we don't shy away from proclaiming amazing truths and horrible truths back to back. Now, we get... With all of that as background, we've kind of done two points so far. We talk about the details of the resurrection. How can this be? Work this out with my Plato philosophy. And then second, the necessity of the resurrection. It has to be there so that Jesus and God actually win the victory over death and death doesn't get to claim our bodies. I want to spend a disproportionate amount of time here in the final verse, which really is Paul's application. And I'm aware of how sensitive this verse is. I'm going to preach it with its full force. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, he's not trying to guilt them. He's trying to lift them up. Stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And you can picture it kind of like this. Uh, there's two supports, there's two pillars going on. There's one at the top and one at the tail at the verse. There's a therefore, which really refers to everything that's come so far in chapter 15 particularly. So Jesus was raised, we will be raised, therefore, I'm telling you. And that's kind of pillar one. And he has a second pillar as well, which comes at the end of the verse. And it says, your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Now, I take it that it is possible to labor in vain. Much of what I give my life to, when eternity comes, will prove to have been in vain. Much of what you give your life to right now, when eternity comes, will have been ultimately in vain. And yet, there also is a labor that is not in vain. 
There is something called the work of the Lord that is not in vain and will last and with reference to eternity has eternal value. Now, he gives two other commands. They're stand firm, let nothing move you. They're saying roughly the same thing, and they point us back to verses 1 and 2 of chapter 15, kind of pulling the whole chapter together, similar language. And on top of that structure is built this central climactic application. This is the so. This is the so what. This is the what do I do now. This is the application of the resurrection of eternal things is always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Now, we need to answer one question very specifically, which is, what exactly did he mean when he said the work of the Lord? Did he mean charity work? Did he mean loving your neighbor as yourself? Did he mean evangelism? Did he mean church activities? Did he mean giving money away? Did he mean being a nice person? Like, what did he mean when he said, give yourself fully, to the work of the Lord. I don't think the answer is all of the above. I don't think so. The reason I think that is because you can trace his language through the rest of the book of 1 Corinthians, where he's used these kind of words before, and it kind of illuminates what he might be meaning here. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13, 1 Corinthians 3, 13, He's talking about different ministries and how some ministries are built on straw and just flimsy foundations. And other ministries are built on firm, truthful gospel foundations. And he says, there are, if anyone builds on this foundation, using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. He's thinking about end times. The day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives the builder will receive a reward. Notice that idea of surviving beyond the last day, meaning that something is of special value, that it's not in vain. That's the first time he uses that concept in 1 Corinthians. He uses it again in chapter 9, verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1, about his own ministry. He says, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord. So he's talking about work in the Lord, work of the Lord. And he says the result of his labor is the church that he's writing to. So something about work of the Lord probably has a result in people believing and being built up in their faith. Uh, You go to 1 Corinthians 16 verse 10 for the third and final reference. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 10. And he talks about Timothy's work in the Lord. So when Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he's with you, for he's carrying on the work of the Lord, just as I am. So the work of the Lord is not a thing that only Paul can do. It seems like at very least Timothy can do it as well. Uh, But notice this. Paul does not write this climactic command to a bunch of people at like a minister's conference or a missionary group or people who all work for Christian schools or something like that, he writes it to the church at Corinth who all had regular jobs. So he can't mean you must all start working for churches. He must mean that this can be worked out in the context of a normal life, not a weird life. (laughs) And so there's one other verse that really helps us get to the heart of what's happening here. And it's back one chapter in uh, 14, 12, 1 Corinthians 14, 12. He says, since you are eager for gifts of the spirit, try to excel, keyword, try to excel in those that build up the church. Now that word excel, uh, when you take it back into the original, is actually a very similar word. It's actually the same root word as give yourselves fully. So some translations, they say, uh, always abound in the work of the Lord. You could say, always excel in the work of the Lord. Uh, It's the same kind of concept there. And he's talking to all Christians about the way they use their gifts. And he's saying, use them for what? Building up the church, not the legal entity the Australian government would recognize, but the people that are the church, the bringing in of new people into the church and the building up of people within the church. And so what does Paul mean specifically and what does he not mean when he says give yourselves fully 
to the work of the Lord? Um, I've got two commentators that have both uh, dragged out, I think, at least one helpful element of the answer. The first guys, they said this, by labor, so your labor's not in vain, is meant Christian ministry above all, but probably also includes any activity that would be undertaken out of commitment to Christ, especially any activity that is burdensome, so it's called labor, that is any activity, key line, that one would not naturally engage in were it not for their faith in Christ. I found that helpful because it talks about activities, not just manner. Activity, not just manner. So Paul saying, give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, doesn't simply mean do what you were doing, but be a bit more Christian about it. Change your manner, be a bit more loving. Now, Paul, everything else in the New Testament holds true, right? Uh, love your neighbor, love God, um, do all of the, like, be increasingly sanctified. But right here, what he's specifically encouraging them to give themselves to in light of eternity and the resurrection, he's saying, I, I think this is really helpful. Activities that one would not naturally engage in were it not for their faith in Christ. Give yourselves fully to those things, not just being a bit more Christian about what you currently do. The next guy goes a bit sharper. He says, rather than general Christian living, the work of the Lord refers to what believers do, not just ministers or something, but believers, to advance the gospel among unbelievers and to establish believers in the gospel. That fitted quite closely for me with all the ways Paul was using that word. Bringing new people in, building them up. Bringing new people in, building them up. Seems to be a good way to think about the work of the Lord. And we're almost there. The application for today could simply be do more at church. But that would be to so drastically undersell the picture and the vision that Paul is trying to offer to the Corinthians and by extension to us. He is talking about reframing the trajectory of your existence. This is much bigger than your involvement in this particular church. What is your life about? What do you give yourself fully to? One of the driving realities of my life is that heaven and hell are real. If they're not real, and if the resurrection didn't happen, Paul said last week, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. True? But if heaven and hell are real, how is there anything more logical, anything more natural than to give yourself fully to the work of the Lord? Nothing else makes sense to me. Grace City, I want to ask you, will you give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because eternity is real? Will you make your life about winning souls, building them up in the faith because the resurrection is for real? Uh, will you set your eyes on the eternal future? And will you raise kids who love Jesus, building them up in the faith? Will you give your life to see your colleagues one to faith? Uh, will you give your life to building up other Christians in your orbit? All of that because eternity is real. And it won't be easy all the time. That's why Paul calls it labor. That's why he had to write to encourage them to continue. Some of you are doing this and you're going really hard. This is my encouragement to you. Good for you. Your labor is not in vain. Good. Um, others, can I plead with you for a second? So much of Sydney lives its life for this, for this life. It lives its life for the, maybe you get 80, 90, 100 years. And we are so focused on the details of that so that I can get this bit right so that the bit just over here will be that tiny little bit better. And if eternity is real, is 
You get a convinced Christian, you look at their life and you probably go, man, they're crazy. That person has lost it. But if eternity is real, you're crazy for living your life. For that. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. So, Ben, you guys can come up. I have four questions for you, Grace City. Four questions that I think this is the thrust of what Paul is getting at. He says, do you believe that Jesus was raised to life? Question two. Do you believe that Jesus' resurrection ensures our resurrection? Question three. Do you believe that our labor in the Lord, therefore, is not in vain? And if you're on three yeses, my question to you is number four. Will you give yourself fully in light of eternity to the work of the Lord? Let me finish with a quote that's captured my heart. Only one life soon will be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Let me pray. God, please make us people who live in light of eternity. Please give us that bigger picture. Please help us to reframe our existences in light of things that will endure and things that will last. Please make us an unusually eternity-focused church. Um, God, we love you. Thank you for securing a great eternity for us. And I pray for people in the room who aren't on board with that yet, that you would, um, that you would soften their hearts. And if you agreed, you said...